Uh, it's a pleasure to see everyone who has come here today for the latest installment in our distinguished uh, visitor series here at Robinson Hall. My name, for anyone who doesn't know me, is Gerard Kennedy. I am the chair of the Distinguishing Visitors Committee here at Robinson Hall, the Faculty of Law at the University of Manitoba. I am located in the faculty, um, which is located in Winnipeg on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Denny's peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. And I think we should bear that in mind today as we consider the topic of human rights at international law, which certainly uh, intersects with Canada's Indigenous populations. But to introduce our speaker and this topic in more depth, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Shell Anderson. Thank you, Gerard. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Shell Anderson. I'm an assistant professor of law at Robson Hall, and I'm also the director of the Master of Human Rights program. So I'm very pleased today to be welcoming Professor William Chavis, who's a, an esteemed international law scholar, as well as being somewhat of a personal mentor of mine as well. And Professor Chavis has what can only be called a storied career in international law. He's a professor of international law at Middlesex University in London. He's also a professor of international law at Leiden University at their campus in The Hague. Uh, he's a professor emeritus as well at the Irish Centre for Human Rights at the National University of Ireland in Galway and an officer in the Order of Canada. So a few years ago, I was fortunate enough to attend Professor Chavis's inaugural lecture at Leiden University. And I was quite struck at that time by how many of his former students were in attendance and also by where they were working. I'm one of them, I suppose. And I think this really spoke to both his impact as well as the esteem he's held in by his former students. They were professors at universities really all over the world, as well as working in the United Nations human rights system, the regional human rights systems, and of course, for international courts. And it really demonstrated, I think, the remarkable impact that Professor Chavis has had on international human rights law and international law more broadly. So I'd like to again thank everybody for attending and especially to thank Professor Chavis for sharing his knowledge and experience with us today. So please, Professor Chavis, if you will. Thank you, Shell. I'm just going to put my slides up. Can you all see that? Can everyone see my slide? Yes. Yes, I can see it. Good. Okay. So everything is working well. Well, thank you very much, Shell. And of course, Shell didn't uh, mention, I guess, what he did obliquely, that he was a doctoral student of mine. So I'm very happy to uh, join him here and to be a guest at the University of Manitoba. And I was telling Shell and Jared before when we were talk we were chatting before the session, um, how I would love to get out to Winnipeg. I've not been there for many years, but it's partly because I haven't lived in Canada for 20 years now. I think the last time I was in Winnipeg was about 15 years ago, and I would love to get back and I would like to see the museum as well. Um, well, uh, I'll get my time. Um, I'm going to talk today about customary international law and human rights. And this is the subject of, uh, of my uh, latest book, which is uh, about to be published. We're now in production and it will be published by uh, Oxford University Press in June of this year, I expect. And the title is The Customary International Law of Human Rights. It's my study of a subject that I had been, um, I, I had on my work plan something to do for many years, and I promised it to people, told them I was working on it, but I kept putting it off for one other priority or another. It wasn't that I wasn't doing stuff, but uh, this project somehow got shunted aside. And uh, COVID-19 uh, gave me the pretext to finish the work. And so uh, I uh, sort of knuckled down in March of last year and uh, worked very hard then for several months during the, during the pandemic uh, to finish the manuscript. And it's been peer reviewed and all of that. And as I say, it's in production. So. I'd love to be able to show you the cover and to give you one of those little brochures so you can uh, 
buy a discounted copy, but I'm not, we're not at that stage yet. But rest assured, it's on its way. And what I'm going to do in the next um, 25, 30 minutes or so is just talk to you a little bit about what's in it and what I've learned about the customary international law of human rights. It's a subject that I say everyone talks about, but you know, to paraphrase Mark Twain, not many people do anything about it. So let's let's go back to the starting point, which is the Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, which is itself just about 100 years old. It was adopted 100 years ago. And uh, they, uh, this is the, uh, the provision, our, the provision we're interested in is paragraph B, international custom as evidence of a general practice accepted as law. And Article 38.1, although it's the governing law for the International Court of Justice, is also widely accepted as being a definitive statement on the primary sources of international law. And probably the third source, uh, the general principles of law is, uh, is, is less important. And really the two big sources are international conventions, that is treaties and international custom. When it was adopted hundred years ago, custom was really the more important part of the law because 100 years ago, there weren't that many treaties. There were no treaties on human rights 100 years ago. There were a few articles in some treaties deal, doing, deal, doing other things that, that were certainly relevant to human rights. But the, the law was very un, underdeveloped human rights. There was no international criminal law uh, and so on. And so um, custom was extremely important. And courts for international courts, and primarily the, the, the International Court of Justice, it was, it was a little different then, and it was called the Permanent Court, um, uh, focused on largely on custom. And for custom, they often look to academic writers, which they, they do very little of today. But over the century, the treaty law has become more and more important because there's been more and more codification. And so the, the, the the relative weight of these has probably shifted from custom to treaty. But it's not always the case in bodies of international law in branches of international law that custom developed and then it was subsequently codified in treaties. And so treaties became the main act, so to speak. In fact, um, some areas of law, human rights law in particular, which is my subject today, were barely existed in 1920 and uh, uh, they uh, and there was no custom so so the the law dealing with human rights international law dealing with human rights went in a different direction in that treaties were adopted first declarations and then treaties mainly within the united nations system and it was only later that custom started to emerge so the treaties were not, when they were adopted, considered to be an attempt to codify an existing custom. Rather, the treaties were negotiated and developed as new law, new creations. And only after they existed did people talk about, about custom. So if I were to say to you, you know, what, 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 do, you, what do you think about a, a customary norm? Where would you look it up? Some of you may be aware that the Supreme Court of Canada um, about a year ago issued a judgment where it spoke about custom, the Nevsom Resources case, which dealt with um, slave labor or, or uh, slave, slavery type practices involving labor and other labor related issues uh, carried out by a Canadian company uh, abroad. And uh, the court, the importance of the decision was that the court recognized that customary law uh, uh, was a source of law in Canada and could form the basis of a lawsuit. They didn't rule on the merits. That will come. They'll decide what it is. Um, and if you were asked, you know, is, is the prohibition of slavery customary international law? You might start with Nefsom resources. But if I said, is the prohibition for, or is the, is the right to marry and found a family part of customary international law, where would you look it up? And the short answer is nobody knows. There's nowhere to look it up. There are no textbooks uh, really where this is discussed in any detail. I shouldn't say none. There've been a couple of efforts and I'm gonna talk about them briefly. Uh, 
But basically, there's no comprehensive source. There's no website for customary international law. If it was treaty law, if I said, you know, is Canada bound by a, by a certain treaty norm, you could find the answer pretty quickly and you'd probably know where to look. And if you didn't, you'd go to a commentary on the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and another commentary on the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and another commentary on the International Convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination, uh, of racial discrimination or discrimination against women. Thousands and thousands of pages with indexes and the stuff is online now so you can do keyword searches. But there's nowhere really today where you could look for customary international law. And that's, that's the problem that I was trying to, that I've been trying to address and trying to, trying to solve. So there are a couple of places that we can find answers in case law. So there are a few references to the customary law of human rights in case law. And I put up on the screen one of the more significant ones because it's essentially the only uh, paragraph in the entire case law of the International Court of Justice, which has been issuing judgments since 1947, 48, roughly, um, and which has dealt with a, a significant number of human rights issues but this is the only one where it talks about something being a customary norm. And here it says, it's probably the most obvious case and the easiest one to answer in a way that the prohibition of torture is part of customary international law. And then they very briefly explain that it's grounded in widespread international practice and the opinio juris of states, which is, these are the two points that are taken from the uh, definition of sources of law that we find in Article 38, widespread international practice. And here they've used the Latin term opinio juris, that is recognized as law by, by states. And, and then they go on essentially to give as examples, not so much the practice as the various texts of treaties, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and so on. And they say that torture has also been prohibition has been introduced into domestic law and that acts of torture are regularly denounced. I'll just make one observation before moving on that torture is still widespread. Um, I looked recently at the case law of the European uh, Court of Human Rights uh, and there's a way on its website where you can look and see how many violations there are by country and there are 47 member states of the Council of Europe, 47 parties to the European Convention on Human Rights, and uh, virtually all of them, I think there are a few exceptions, maybe Andorra, maybe Monaco, you know, a few little states, but basically every state in the Council of Europe, every part, state party has been found to have violated the prohibition on torture and other cruel and human or degrading treatment or punishment. So what I can extract from that is that the fact that there's a violation of the norm of course, doesn't mean that it's not recognized as a customary norm. But this is an, this is an easy one, really, torture. Um, if I were to ask you on an exam, you know, uh, are, there any, are there any human rights norms that are prohibited by customary law? Probably I get more answers for torture than for anything else. There's another source in what we might call positive law. This isn't exactly case law and it's not exactly a court but it's the Human Rights Committee, which is like a court and its pronouncements on the, the treaty that it applies, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights are quite authoritative. And in 1994, so almost 30 years ago, the committee was addressing the issue of reservations and it issued in a, in a general comment that was about three or four pages long, these few sentences on customary international law. And it was doing it to discuss the permissibility of reservations when you could make reservations to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And they provide a short list here. I won't read it, you're probably reading it, um, of a number of civil and political rights because that's what they're applying. They don't list all of the civil and political rights in the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And so they're making some sort of a distinction. Uh, some rights they say are customary and others are not. Uh, part of my research involved trying to get to the bottom of this and to see what kind of debates they had about how to draft the list. And 
there's nothing. Uh, there's nothing in the in the public documents because not all of the um, summary records of the Human Rights Committee are available publicly. So there's nothing in the public documents, but I have my little networks and my contacts. And so I was in touch with the, someone who was the secretary of the Human Rights Committee who has the archives and he could find nothing else. And then he said, well, I'll check with some of the members at the time and see what they remember. Nobody could remember anything. So this is lost in the fog of, of history as to where the list comes from, but it's a narrow list. It's very uh, uh, conservative. Uh, you can see this, for example, where they, they talk about uh, executing pregnant women or children, uh, that that's prohibited. And even that isn't exactly what's in the covenant on civil and political rights. Everybody agrees you can't exercise children. Our problem is when they want to ex execute adolescents. So even the worst countries in the world will say, well, we're not going to execute a seven-year-old for a crime, but they will maybe execute a 15 or 16-year-old. And the covenant on civil and political rights says it's 18. And yet the Human Rights Committee was even cautious here and only said not execute children. So that's basically what we have. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about the history of the, the debate, the conversation about customary international law. As I mentioned at the outset, the, uh, the human rights law developed really through texts before it was codified. Of course, the fundamental human rights that we find in a place like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights were, were, were drawn out of constitutions and some of those rights were recognized, but in national law. So we have to bear in mind here, what we're looking at is international law. The idea in the 1940s that states were bound as a question of international law by a series of human rights norms was an absolutely radical and revolutionary idea. And of course it became extremely important. It was extremely successful, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that in, in the 1940s, uh, nobody considered that there was any customary law of, of human rights. And you can look at the, as I did at the debates when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was being adopted and in the writings of scholars at the time, including Hirsch Lauterpacht, and nobody ever thought that there was anything resembling customary international law of human rights. Some of them like Lauterpacht spoke about natural law, but that's something different. Natural law is neither national nor international. It's, it comes from somewhere else. But, but in terms of international law, Nobody really considered that there was a customary law of human rights. So there was no talk about custom and it was only in the late sixties when custom started to be part of the conversation. Um, one of the things that happened in the middle of the 1960s was that the first of the major human rights treaties were adopted. First, the racial discrimination convention in 1995 and then the two covenants in, in, I'm sorry, 1965, and then the two covenants in 1966. The two covenants required 35 states each to enter into force, and that took a decade. It wasn't until, um, until 1976 that they entered into force. So there was a, a growing frustration then with the development of international law, and that led scholars and activists to start saying, maybe there's a customer international law as well. But where do they turn to find where the customary law was? They turn to instruments like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so that's when this discussion starts to emerge. And then it got a huge boost in the late 70s and really into the 1980s, in the, mainly among American academics in the United States. And a lot of that was, I mean, there's one thing that's very well known in human rights circles was this discovery of what they called the Alien Tort Claims Statute or the Alien Tort Claims Act. And that enabled uh, litigation before American courts uh, for uh, gross systematic violations of the law of nations, that is customer international law. So American lawyers started to argue uh, customer international law before the courts of the United States. And there were a number of judgments um, basically on a limited number of issues like torture and enslavement. Uh, and, um, and that kind of dominated because, they, because you know, it's the United States. So they, their academics write a lot of articles, publish in a lot of journals, and 
I think a lot of people in the world thought, maybe some still do, that the Alien Tort Claims Act is some very important part of international human rights law. It is south of our border, but that's it. And it's really irrelevant to the rest of the world, largely. But it became a, an important part of discussions. And I think the other feature of it was in the United States, the reason that customary law became so important was because the US didn't ratify the treaties. And it wasn't until the 1990s that the United States ratified some of the international treaties, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Racial Discrimination Convention and the Torture Convention. But of course, even today, it's still, it has still to ratify the main treaties. In, in one case, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, it's all alone. And in others, it's in a, it's in a very tiny minority, the Convention on Discrimination Against Women, for example, with I think six or seven states, aside from the United States, there are a few, a handful of Pacific Island states, population totaling perhaps 100,000 people, and that's it. So um, this is the, the, a little bit of the background or the history of the debate. Um, and there hasn't been much on it since the mid 1990s when the Human Rights Committee issued this decision that I, that I referred to, the general comment, other than the, um, the uh, um, judgment with that paragraph of the International Court of Justice to which I referred. So my view is that it's, it's reviving in terms of its significance, that there are a number of places where international, where customary international law uh, will be relevant. The example, of course, we have in Canada in the Nepson resources decision, that's going to, I would expect, unleash other litigation and lawyers, human rights activists, will be turning, uh, looking, looking for, for different rights to see whether they're uh, subject, whether the rights are actually enshrined in customer international law. Now, one of my theories about this is that it's a lot easier to identify customer international law today than it was 25 years ago when we had this initial debate in the late 1980s and the early 1990s. That debate was, was quite confined because there, the sources that, that we have today were not available then. And there are two in particular that I think are extraordinarily important. The first is the near universal ratification of the major human rights treaties. Not quite all of them. So we know the torture convention is still, I think, in the 150s in terms of ratifications. And the Convention on Enforced Disappearance has yet to get a huge amount of momentum. And the Convention on the Rights of Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families has never had much traction, and that hasn't changed. But the other treaties, starting with the Convention on the Rights of the Child at 196 states parties, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women at 189, the Convention on Racial Discrimination on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities at, I think, 182 or 183. And then the covenants that are about 170, 170 for one, 173 for the other. So they are near universal. And so we can look at those treaties <clears throat> and we can draw conclusions that the majority of this, that the, that the, part, the states that are parties to those treaties would not challenge the idea that not only are they bound by treaty, but that the rights in those treaties are customary international law. And I think it's an important source. And as you could see from the judgment I cited of the International Court of Justice, so does the International Court of Justice when they turn to the, to the Convention Against Torture. They don't talk about the number of states parties and they don't talk about which, which is on the low side for the Convention Against Torture. But certainly when we're looking at the Convention on the Rights of the Child or on the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, we're talking about virtual um, universal ratification with a few gaps. <clears throat> I mentioned the United States, but you know, if the rest of the world recognizes something as torture, the United States may be uh, recognizes something as customary law, the United States may be what we call a persistent objector, if they can demonstrate that, but they can't prevent the customary rule from forming. The other thing is the problem of reservations to the treaties, which have, has been a, a theme in human rights debates for, for 30 years now, 25 years about the
the widespread reservations to some of these treaties. But although reservations are a, are, are a challenge and they're generally not desirable, and some of them are, are, are very, very broad, very overly broad, um, when one has a closer look at them, um, not from the standpoint of trying to determine what the state's obligations are under the treaty, but rather to determine whether the, what the state objects to, we find that actually the, the problems are rather insignificant or rather minor. So when we take a convention like the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, we have a number of ratifications. So we have some of these what are sometimes called the Islamic reservations where they say that the treaty is subject to Sharia law. And that's obviously unacceptable and it creates, and the objections to these reservations make it clear, great uncertainty about what the obligations of the state are under the treaty. But when we look a little more closely at it and we look at the, state, the state's reports to the relevant committee, we find that actually their problems are quite limited. And there are no states that come, for example, to the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women who say, we believe that we can discriminate against women on this and this and this area. And certainly none of them are gonna say that they think they're entitled to discriminate against women, which makes it pretty straightforward to say that the prohibition of discrimination against women must be a universal norm. The other thing that's changed a lot is this new procedure, relatively new, uh, called the Universal Periodic Review at the Human Rights Council. And not only does it provide us with, it, what it does is it fills the gaps in the treaty ratifications. So if we take a treaty like the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, it has 173 states parties. So there are more than 20 states that haven't ratified it. But we can look at the Universal Periodic Review, we can look up close at that, and we find that those states, when they make their reports to the Human Rights Council, reporting on a broad range of human rights, they report on their compliance, allegedly, their, what they claim to be their compliance, with human rights that are found in the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So we can look through for these states, we can look through their reports and we can say, actually, they don't disagree with the right to privacy. They don't disagree with the right to marry and to found a family because they report on this. A country like China, to give you an example, it has not ratified the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It has no treaty norms dealing with the restrictions on the use of capital punishment. But at the Universal Periodic Review, China will come with a report where it will explain that it complies with various restrictions on the use of capital punishment that correspond to the relevant paragraphs of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And in fact, some countries come to the Universal Periodic Review, I'm thinking of Malaysia as an example, there are some others, and they say, we haven't ratified the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but we don't disagree with these articles. And there's a, a significant number among the 20 odd states that haven't ratified them that are very small Pacific Island states. I think there are probably about 10 of them that haven't ratified the, that treaty and, and some of the other treaties. And they have a total population of about a million. I, I mean, total 10 states taken together. These are small states. Now, I don't mean to be disparaging. Small states have as, the same rights as big states, but their explanation for why they haven't ratified the treaty is simply that they don't have the resources to do all of the paperwork that's in, involved. And we could, we could quarrel with them whether that's a good explanation, but the point is they don't disagree with it substantially. So let me, let me move on now just to talk briefly about what the content is, because I said, you know, where would you look it up? And I wanna tell you some of my ideas about where you would look this up. Um, so I use as a guide, as a starting point for my study of the norms of customary law. And I should say the book has a whole section where some of these ideas I've explained about the methodology and the history of the debate and so on, where I discussed, and that's sort of the, the theoretical analytical part. But there's also an, a, a big part, which is simply looking it up. And I have a list of human rights uh, uh, organized by theme um, and that you can, you can look it up and you can see whether, in my opinion, there's a good claim to it being 
a norm of customary international law. Now, I'm 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 not Moses, or or I, I guess the guy Moses got the got the Ten Commandments from. I don't claim to be um, the authoritative source of this. I'm not trying to declare what customary international law is. So I tend to frame my discussion of it by saying there's strong evidence. Um, there's a good case to be made for this, or there's weak evidence, or there's no evidence for it being a customary norm. And uh, I, as I say, I don't purport to have the last word on it, but somebody who's looking for a starting point for trying to make the case that something is a norm of customary international law, I think is gonna find a lot of useful material in what I've compiled. So my starting point for the organization of this was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I basically you know, cut it, did it, did, broke it down, not by article, but into specific rights that were there. And then I added some of the other rights that have become part of either clearly part of human rights law or what we refer to as being part of this related cognate concept of people's rights, like the right to peace, to a healthy environment, the right to development, and the right to self-determination. And I look at all of those. You got to um, love Patrick. I, I look at all of those in-, in uh, I don't know how old he is. His personal it, Facebook page, he appears to have a girlfriend or- I think there's somebody who should have their microphone off. Um, <laughs> so, I want to just draw your attention to one of the points that I think is a, one of the, the thematic areas that, that I attach a lot of importance to and that is neglected. In, in the human rights committee's discussion of what were customary norms, they focused on civil and political rights, but that's because it's the human rights committee and they're talking about, um, uh, about rights that appear in the covenant on civil and political rights. But the, the other materials that were issued at the time in the United States, for example, a, a book published by Theodore Meron, and then something that they, an, an unofficial statement of the law that they call the restatement, were, was entirely confined to the core civil and political rights. And I'm not going to try and dispute that those core civil and political rights, like the prohibition of torture and slavery, are not norms of customary international law. But that part of it's easy, really, really relatively straightforward uh, to demonstrate. But moreover, I believe that that part of it is emphasized because of the historic uh, neglect of economic, social, and cultural rights. And my view is that when we look up close at our economic, social, and cultural rights, we find a strong and as clear and maybe even a more convincing case for them being norms of customary international law. Let me take as an example, um, the right to education, something that concerns us all, that we, we all exercise, and um, our, many of us are still exercising. And the, right to and, and the, the right to education is something that no state will dispute. Uh, if we look at the sources I referred to, we can, we can start with the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And, and there are no reservations by any state to the Convention on the Rights of the Child saying, we don't think that we have to provide education to children. You know, we recognize the rights of children, but no, some children, no education. Uh, they don't have a right to education. No state would maintain this. And none of them will show their face at the Human Rights Council and, and try and challenge that. Uh, in fact, virtually every state will claim that they provide free compulsory education at the primary level to their population. There are a few exceptions and I discuss them, but I don't think they're significant. There are far fewer exceptions there than they are to the states who claim that they respect the probe, that, that, that they recognize the prohibition of torture and then practice it in one way or another. And we can do this with other economic, social and cultural rights in the same way. Uh, and uh, we can we can see we see huge social transformations. We have to bear in mind that the right to education. I think even in Canada, I don't know when we had universal compulsory primary education, but it might have been by the end of the 19th century. I'm not an expert on this, but I know that in many countries it was possible for adults never to be educated 
at all uh, until fairly recently. But that that has changed, and we can see this in global rates of literacy and numeracy and so on. And as I say, I think we should do this with the other economic, social, and cultural rights. And I think that we might reflect about the consequence of our pandemic in terms of our vision of the mandatory uh, nature of some of those economic and social and cultural rights. I think that there's a, a sense today that, and I wonder if, if any state would dispute this, that everyone has a right to be vaccinated against the coronavirus. Well, those are just examples. Um, so I think I should stop there. I think I've given you the outline of my project, what I'm, I'm, I've tried to do. As I say, I think it's more of a starting point, but there, there are no books on, there are, I, I don't want to say there are no books. There's the book that Theodore Meron published in, I think, 1989, and it's just, it's woefully out of date, and it's entirely focused on the, on the core civil and political rights, which incidentally, and this has been pointed out by other writers, more or less correspond to what's in the American Bill of Rights. So it's a very American limited version of customary international law, very limited. Um, and uh, uh, there have been a couple of uh, collections of essays where people have written about, about human rights law, but more in order to question the theoretical basis of identifying customary uh, norms of, of human rights. One of the, the things that happened in the 1980s and 1990s as this su subject was being discussed was that there was a, a tendency to downplay the element of state practice in favor of the uh, element of what's called the opinio juris. In other words, to say, you can find customer international law through one of the elements and not both of the elements that are in the famous paragraph in the statute of the International Court of Justice. And so there's been some writing on that. I refer to it, of course, in my book, but I've tried to avoid that debate um, because I think that we don't need to dismiss the importance of state practice in order to demonstrate the customary norms. I don't think we need to focus exclusively on the opinio juris as manifested in the treaties and declarations, because through mechanisms like the Universal Periodic Review and the uh, reports by states to the treaty bodies, we can identify the practice of those states and that gives us the other elements. So my, my book is, is, is basically premised on this idea that we don't, we don't need to redefine the, 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 the concept of customary international law in order to identify the customary law of human rights. And uh, so, as I say, I'm going to conclude there, but I hope there'll be some questions and some discussion about this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shabis, for that, that fascinating talk, I think. I, I think I could say that this book has the potential to be maybe your most influential book. I mean, I, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but uh, you've written many books, obviously, on human rights. But just there's so little written on what customary law actually is beyond these kind of rote things drawing from Article 38 and beyond kind of the use cogens norm, uh, norm standard list, things like genocide and slavery and all the rest. We know that it goes beyond that, but it's difficult to say exactly what it is. So your book sounds uh, extremely useful. So we'll, we have time for questions as well. And I'll, I'll just ask you to post uh, questions in the comments. I uh, just also want to tell everyone present that I'm, thank you very much, Dr. Shabbos for the presentation. I'm gonna stop the Q&A just to permit broader, or sorry, not, I'm gonna stop the recording for the Q&A to permit more open uh, discussions. So before I turn it back to Dr. Edison to, uh, to ref the Q&A, thank you.